conductive, radiant, uh, convective loads, and we have to manage those, understand what they are, and try to figure out the right application to have them. Um, so I think that kind of covers everything that's on those things. So how do we also have to look at mass transfer and mass mixing? Uh, we tend to mix airstreams. We have an airstream that comes back from the room, at 78, 75, whatever temperature is in the room, and mix it with outside air. That's going to have a different mass, a different temperature, a different humidity. So all of us are doing equilibrium equations for what is the temperature that's going into our heat transfer device, the adding temperature, the adding heat to it or subtracting heat to it. Bernoulli. So like I mentioned, we have, uh, we're trying to move a fluid. In this case, an all-air system, we're moving air. Uh, air is a fluid. It's a non-Newtonian fluid, so it always it does some screwy things for us. But fundamentally, it's about moving pressure from a, a high-pressure area to a low-pressure area, managing the, that, that pressure. Um, in a ductwork system, you'll have return air that comes back from the space. That tends to be the entry spot. Um, so this graph here is really just showing what pressure. So this would be kind of your room pressure here. As we start to enter into the return ductwork and go back to the main fan, you can see here the static pressure, the pressure of the ductwork actually starts to become lower. So you have a negative pressure. We want to move that air, we want to encourage it to go other places. So then we'll have a fan in there that increases the pressure and moves it out to the space. Um, we have a series of simplified programs that, that make this life a lot easier for us instead of having to go through the full derivation of how we apply Bernoulli and how we do, uh, do that. We, we tend to rough it out to uh, more approximations of how much pressure loss per linear foot do we get. So we know uh, if we have 100 feet of ductwork, we're only going to have you know, a tenth or two tenths of an inch of pressure loss we can think. Same thing we do with elbows. An elbow may have an equivalent length of 10 or 15 feet. So we try to simplify the math so we make it a lot easier rather than having to do the full derivation of Bernoulli the entire time. Um, similar on piping systems, uh, with water, it's a little bit easier of a system. Uh, to handle, but uh, again, we're doing uh, looking at the static energy involved. How much how much water do we need to fill the entire building up? How much velocity losses do we have as we pump through the entire piping network as well? We get into a little bit more complicated systems as we start to introduce uh, one of the big things that starts to become thermal energy storage. Uh, you start to see big big chill water storage tanks. One of the things we start to do uh, is play with electricity rates. In Texas and in the Midwest states, a lot of wind energy and free energy is generated at night, very low cost energy. So they have excess energy because at nighttime, uh, we're pretty low on energy demand. Our peak energy demands tend to be in the middle of the day when everybody wants full air conditioning. So how do we take advantage of that situation? One of, the, one of the scenarios we use is called thermal energy storage, whether it's a chill water storage tank where we generate a whole bunch of cold water at night, we store it about 40 degrees, and during the daytime when energy costs is expensive and we don't want to make chill water, we'll drain that tank down, we'll drain the energy. So we'll store, you'll we'll warm that tank up during the day, cool it back down at night, and then change, transfer that energy out uh, during the day. Uh, create some complications on the fluid side. From, from a pumping system. So for example, most chill water storage tanks, about 30, 40 feet high, some of them are taller than that. Once we attach it to a building that's 100, 120 feet high, now we're having to figure out how do we manage water that needs to be 120 feet above, that if we get over 120 feet above in this tank, we're going to start to perform the tank right away. So the complexities involved with the thermal energy storage tank, uh, we tend to look at pressure reducing valves, how are we managing the pressure in the system, so that we don't overflow the tank, but we keep the building satisfied. Uh, refrigeration. So the second law really is about, the second law of thermodynamics says it's got to go from a high energy source to a low energy source, fundamentally. Um, to do that, we use uh, compressors, which pump the energy around. We have condensers, which will condense it and change the phase of the refrigerant. We have expansion valves that again change the phase back, an evaporator, it's managing the phase change of the refrigerator. Um, this is the heart of what you see inside. Uh, inside your house, you have an evaporator. Uh, 
that's what cools down the air, right? We have the compressor that usually sits outside or outside the outside unit. We have a condenser outside. That's where it's hot. So fundamentally, we're trying to move cold air, we're trying to extract the energy from outside, from inside, excuse me, back to the outside. So we're adding all the heat to the outside and moving them off the inside because we're generating too much. The reverse happens when we get to a heat pump site. Uh, if it's too cold inside, we're trying to extract some cold, some air, some energy from the air outside and move it inside. So fundamentally, you start to see heat pumps start to fail about 40 degrees. It starts to kick on the electric heat, start to kick on the gas furnace. It's very difficult to extract any energy out of 40 degree air or anything lower than that. So we have to kick on supplemental means of heat. I mentioned the heat pump cycle. Uh, there's several ways to do this. Uh, the heat pump uh, is an air to air, is what we see in most houses. Uh, when we look at geothermal loops, we go water to air. So instead of using the ambient air uh, to extract heat from or to reject heat from, like I mentioned, we use the earth. Uh, the downside is sometimes, in, if you think of a data center where it's 24 7 cooling, uh, we can't continuously reject heat to the earth. At some point, the earth battery, for lack of a better description, becomes completely and totally full. And the heat rejection here stops working. And we have to find supplemental means to do this. So one of the things we have to do if we do a geothermal heat pump or any kind of water-based heat pump is how do we manage the temperature of that water. In the case of the geothermal system, we try to look, is the well field balanced? Do we have enough heat going in in the summer? So we charge it up nice and warm so we get a lot of summer energy stored in the earth. And in the winter, we're going to come back and extract all of that heat energy we projected to it in the middle of summer, and we're going to use it to heat ourselves. And we reverse the whole thing. We can manage that by oversizing the well field. So sometimes we have more capacity than we need in there, so we don't charge it all the way up in the summer. And we extract just a little bit more out in the winter, and we keep that cycle going. Eventually, the well field becomes oversaturated. That's one of the challenges we end up having with geothermal is not necessarily the day one design, but how we manage the day one. Year 20 design on beyond that. One of the newer things that started out in the 70s but it's become bigger and bigger has become uh, co generation of heat recovery. Uh, one thing you'll see coal fired power plants, natural gas fired power plants, even if they're combined cycle, the most efficient ones, they tend to have an overall cycle efficiency in the 40 to 50 percent, meaning that 40 percent of the energy that we put into it, whether it's natural gas or burning coal, goes to making the electricity. The remaining 50 to 60 percent goes up the sacks. It's lost as heat energy, it's lost in combustion inefficiencies, those sorts of things. So we start to look at how do we do heat recovery off of this process. It becomes a cogeneration plant. Uh, Virginia Tech does this. They have a, uh, inside the steam plant, used to generate steam to, to heat all the buildings on campus to provide process steam for cooling, or process steam for uh, laboratory sanitization, humidification, those sorts of things. One of the things they also do when they have excess steam, they use it to spin a uh, electric generator. So they're generating electricity off of their steam source as well. Uh, they're using excess steam to do that. One of the things we look at doing is, do we use an electricity generator and recover heat off of that? Uh, for example, in a data center, sometimes it can be very advantageous to run a generator all the time off natural gas recover heat, distribute it somewhere else, sell that heat to somebody else, but we use all the electricity in the data center where we use electricity to generate cooling. There's a lot of different uh, approaches that we can take from cogeneration to try to recover the energy we're generating in one place, put it to use somewhere else as opposed to it being wasted uh, up, a, up a stack, reject it to a radiator, or anything else like that. Chemistry. I mentioned we like to kill uh, bad things. Uh, <laughs> How many of you heard about New York City, about people dying from Legionella? Heard about Legionnaire statistics? Every, everybody heard about that. Um, one of the things we're probably most proud of as HVAC engineers, is a lot of people belong to our professional society. They used to be called the American Society of Heating, Refrigerating, and Air Conditioning Engineers. Uh, we changed that to ASHRAE because we started to expand our reach to around the globe. But fundamentally, that's what ASHRAE stood for. Uh, and for the past uh, 60 years since we were founded, We've had a consensus professional development approach to how do we approach our industry. One of the things we had been working on before the latest Legionella outbreak in New York City that attracted so much attention was how do we manage uh, building water systems. Cooling towers are a fundamental piece of how do we reject heat. 
way a cooling tower works, if you have a large building like this, we'll have fan cool units throughout the room. That's a local air conditioner with a couple coils and fan. Fan cool unit, right? So it's self-explanatory on that one. That'll generally have chill water or hot water going to it. The chill water loop is served by a chiller. So as we recirculate air through the fan cool unit, the water that's feeding that fan cool unit is warmed up. We send that back to a central chill water plant. The chiller then cools it down. How does the chiller cool the water down? It does it through a refrigeration cycle. There's two ways we can reject the heat from that chiller. One is an air cooler piece of equipment, which is pretty common on smaller buildings. Has anybody ever walked out front here and seen the great big steam cloud that comes up front? That's from the cooling tower. That is what is rejecting the heat. That's from a water cooled device. So a cooling tower is what we like to call a dumpster with some showers in it. Uh, <laughs> It's an open device. So the chiller runs at 45 to 55 degrees. Say the, uh, the fan cooling will return water back at about 55 degrees. The chiller will take that, cool it back down through the refrigeration cycle, send 45 degree water out to the fan cools, it'll warm it back up, send it to the chiller, and the process restarts itself. Uh, the chiller has to reject its heat. <clears throat> through, the, through the refrigeration cycle we saw earlier, it generally operates at about 85 to 95 degrees. We take that 85 degree water that's coming back from the cooling tower, we run it through the chiller. So the chiller then rejects all the heat it absorbed from that 45 to 55 degree loop, sends it back to the cooling tower. What happens at the cooling tower? We run it through shower heads and we spray it over a fancy term we call fill, but essentially just a bunch of plastic. And we run a fan at the top of it and we let the air come across all that plastic fill and across all that shower driven air. And because the wet bulb temperature, the moisture content, I don't have a nice second metric chart, I had that conversation earlier, but because of the uh, wet bulb temperature's humidity level in there, typically that is a lot cooler than 85 degrees. So all of a sudden we're using that sending 95 degree water out of the shower head over the plastic fill, drawing some cooler air across it, and cooling all that water back down. A lot of good things for that. One, it's a lot easier if you look at the weather channel, you look at all these data for what the temperatures are, there's two components to temperature. It's dry bulb, which is kind of what's red on every thermometer everywhere, right? Then there's the wet bulb temperature. We need two points to define the energy of air. We need to know what is sensible, which is really just kind of what you read on, on, a, on a thermometer, and what is the humidity content of the air. Those two points will give you uh, what the energy of the air is and how much it's going to take to change the property of that air. So a cooling tower will cool it down. If we get into a particular situation, um, really wish I'd put a slide chart in this now. Um, you will start to cross the saturation line. At that point, you start to get the cooling tower plumes that you see, and that is the primary heat rejection device for the entire building. The whole point of this conversation is Legionella comes from cooling towers and unmanaged water sources. The bacteria likes to grow between about 70 degree water temperature and 140 degree water temperature. If you don't manage the bacteria that's growing in that range, and you have to operate in that range, and cooling towers always operate in that range, uh, you will get biological diseases in the air. If we, one, place cooling towers in a bad spot, so all of a sudden the cooling tower discharges right beside an air intake, all those pathogens that are in the cooling tower air will come right back into the outside air intake. If we haven't managed the biological growth inside of that cooling tower, we're going to have pathogens that spread the building, and generally those with weak, weak immune systems are most impacted by it. It's called Legionnaire's disease because it started in, I want to say, 1976 in Pittsburgh, or in Philadelphia, in, I think it's Pittsburgh, Philadelphia. where, uh, Philadelphia. Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was a Legionnaire's conference, or uh, American Legion conference. Right and so many people were impacted by it and sickened by it because they tended to be older with a little more, with a little weaker immune systems and the cooling tower was, was placed in the wrong spot, outside air intake was placed in the wrong spot, we brought pathogens in, a whole bunch of people got sick, a whole bunch of people died. The most recent example was in New York City. Uh, again, cooling towers in a bad spot, unmanaged. The presence of pathogens in the tower water didn't indicate it was necessarily going to kill somebody with the activity in the unmanaged nature of this pathogen in the cooling tower water. That's why we use chemical treatment. That's how we use chemistry to fight biology. Uh, the other thing we have to do uh, from a water system is we have to control 
the corrosion, the chemistry inside the chemical, the chemical makeup of our materials, we tend to use steel and copper inside of our systems. All the piping is either going to be likely black carbon steel or generic power. Those two don't like each other. They're on slightly different ends of the uh, cathodic galvanic scale. You can see here if we have uh, black steel, we've got cast iron and model steel up here. We've got copper down here. The chemistry teachers will tell you if we're on opposite ends, we're going to get a current through there and they're going to start to corrode each other. Uh, so we use dielectric brakes. We try to monitor the corrosion in there. We'll have, chemical, we'll have coupon stations in there that are seeing what the chemistry of the water is doing and how is it eating the metal away over time. Off-gassing. I mentioned every material has an off-gassing property. Uh, we use ventilation to do that. There are several ways we calculate ventilation. Again, uh, because of the chemistry involved and the highly complex nature of analyzing exactly what comes off of every piece of carpet, uh, there tend to be general rules of thumb that have been established. Uh, depending on your occupancy, in office space, we know we need 0.06 CFM of outside air for every square foot of an office space. That's based on an assumed load that these chairs aren't too bad, the carpet's not too bad, and the walls aren't too bad. We go to a preschool, we go to an elementary school. We know we have more stuff on the walls that's going to have worse off gassing. We have to manage that more. So all of a sudden we start to double our ventilation rates on a per area basis so that we manage the off gassing from all the contaminants within the space. And similarly, kids are more active than adults in general. Uh, if you have a healthcare environment, we will start to increase the ventilation per person to minimize the potential that what you've got, I don't get. Or what someone else gets, what a sick kid in a nurse's station gets, we don't get either. We don't transmit around the entire school. Um, one thing I didn't mention, but I thought about it as I was sitting at the table at dinner, uh, someone asked what the most interesting thing I do as a mechanical engineer is. Uh, the other thing we do with chemistry and biology is we will design systems to contain or minimize the spread of biologics and chemical agents. Um, we do biologic safety labs, biological safety labs, where we do research on uh, nasty chemicals, nasty uh, cancers, uh, those sorts of things. We have to contain, contain and minimize the presence of those in the airstreams. Uh, Virginia Tech's uh, research institute down here at Brilliant substantial number of labs. You see a few mud, there's going to be nasty stuff being done out there. We have to manage that. We have to filter. We have to do those sorts of things. Uh, the reverse situation happens when uh, federal property. What happens in uh, 2001 when we had the anthrax attacks? We had uh, people threaten you know, multiple biological agents, chemical warfare agents. Uh, the worst ones are toxic industrial chemicals. Somebody drives a tank, tanker truck full of chlorine somewhere and it opens up the valve. Chlorine's pretty bad for us. Uh, so one of the things I get to do as a mechanical engineer sometimes is design the buildings to resist uh, a chemical warfare attack, a biological agent attack, uh, even radiation fallout from a nuclear warhead or a dirty bomb. Uh, those get kind of interesting. We get into chemical reactions between carbon and the various airstreams. Uh, we get into what happens if somebody's really smart and knows that the carbon makeup and it is going to react with this chemical warfare agent. As soon as I put a second one through it, it's going to release the first one because of the chemical reactions that occur in there. So we're looking at multiple carbon beds to be able to handle a very sophisticated chemical attack. The other thing we look at is a building uh, is tight, right? We have a, a vapor barrier. We have a barrier to resist the ingress of air into the space. We also try to put excess air in the building so it stays positively pressurized against the wind. Uh, the minimum amount of pressurization we do is generally not sufficient for higher winds. If you get to 20 mile an hour winds, 30 mile an hour winds, 40 mile an hour winds, you're going to get some air blowing into the window. If we're designing a building to protect against a biological or chemical attack, we've got to start upping that pressure that we build into the building. That starts to impact our fans because now we have to handle more static pressure and we have to raise the pressure of the building above the baseline ambient condition. Have you developed, a, or are you saying you maybe have developed a means of implementing the increase in pressure on demand as needed? Yeah, you can do that too. So it doesn't have to be that way all the time? Correct. Yeah, if you have, if you have a known, uh, like say today, 
we don't have any intelligence that indicates anything's going to happen today. We feel pretty good. We're going to run and we're just going to resist a five mile an hour wind. Let's say we get some intelligence that says, hey, something might be going down, you know, the weather's not too bad, so we're going to go up to, say, a tenth or, or 0.15 inches of pressure. And we know that's going to provide a slight positive pressure. We know it's going to be a really bad day. It's going to be crazy windy. We're almost positive that the attack is going to come. We'll start bumping that pressure up. That's what we need to do. Uh, so you have contracts with the Pentagon. <laughs> I do not care much out of it. That's all right. That's all right. But no, there are there are ways to react to a known threat environment. Um, one of the most interesting things I was talking with the professor before the meeting, uh, plain English programming is starting to come to temperature control systems. And not just when we say temperature control systems, that's what we do as HVAC engineers to control the temperature in the space. But really they start to go beyond temperature control systems, they're pressure control systems, they're Condition temperature control, the humidity control. Um, depending on the level of intelligence and the level of sensor we have, they're particulate controlled. Um, there are sensors out there that will read if there are biologics. Uh, biologics are incredibly difficult to detect in real time. Uh, we just know there's a biologic. Uh, unfortunately, the pollen flags up as a biologic. If in the middle of springtime, a biological sensor will, will trigger because we have excess pollen in the air and it will fall. You don't know, is it a bad biologic? Is it an okay one? It just says, hey, I got a problem. Uh, fortunately, unfortunately, I guess, chemical warfare agents and toxic chemicals are a more well-known uh, system. Those can be more detected much quicker via a chemical process because there's a known chemical reaction that will happen that will make it inert within the sensor, but it'll tell us exactly what happened. So our control systems, even though they're temperature control systems, uh, the biggest challenge we have is how do people know they're doing what they should be doing. A lot of the programming that goes into these, uh, it, it evolved probably about 40 years ago. For years we used compressed air. And you would have some, you'd have a temperature sensor on the wall. As the temperature went up, there was a diaphragm inside. It changed the position of that diaphragm. It increased or decreased the pressure, which moved about somewhere to maintain that pressure where it was. Uh, in the late 80s, we started going to electrics, where you would see a voltage change. And you would use 0 to 10 volts, and you would change the response to the voltage. We still do that to an extent now, but we use direct digital controllers. And we use programming. There's a substantial amount of software programming that goes into a HVAC control system now that says, when this happens, do this. Uh, the biggest challenge we had years ago was nobody knew how to program. Or the only people who knew how to program wrote Microsoft Word, they wrote Pac-Man, they wrote Space Invaders. Um, so all of a sudden you had all these guys who used to do pneumatics, used to do electrics, trying to write logic for this. Or we'd bring in the software guys and say, hey, we want you to do this, and they wouldn't understand the physics behind the HVAC system. They wouldn't understand how the system is supposed to react in any of these events, or they would think they did, and we'd get something wrong. But then nobody would know how to debug the program. They wouldn't know what it's supposed to do. So one of the latest things that's come to us has started to be plain English programming. So that says, when the temperature is at 78 degrees, open the damper to cool the room down. When it's at 68, close the damper. So that plain English programming is starting to come around to us as well, which has been a very good thing for us as these things have started to evolve. Is the big challenge we have on these complicated control systems that nobody knows what we're supposed to be doing. I love to tell you, I know I think they're supposed to be doing, but I got to tell. As an engineer, I have to write a sequence of operations. I have to write a control schematic and says, this is what I'd like it to do. We hand it out to the contractor. The contractor hands it to a temperature controls guy. He's going to go out and write the software out in the field and say, this is what it's going to do. Sometimes those don't always apply, so it becomes a bit of a challenge for us on the controls perspective. Refrigerant selection for us has been a big deal. Who's heard of Montreal Protocol? Who's heard of the Kyoto Protocol? Yeah. Yeah. Who's got the new air conditioner in the past five years, since 2010? It's a new refrigerant. Anybody Always. seen how big how, how the change in size? The old one that I had in my house, I have two one and a half ton air conditioners right now. The old outside unit was probably half the size of the podium. Then I got a new one. It's about the size of this podium. So what happened? Um, in 1986, 
I recall correctly. The Montreal Protocol was signed after we realized we were burning a hole through the ozone layer. Uh, up until that point, uh, we had what we thought were gloriously efficient refrigerants, and we had used them for the past 80 years since refrigeration was invented by Willis Carey and Rubens Train uh, way back in the 1910s. Before 1986, we selected refrigerations based on how much performance could we get out of that refrigerant. How efficient could we make that refrigerant? How much could we put into there? We didn't care about how much leakage it was. We didn't care about the environmental effects. So this is a listing of all our refrigerants. These are all chemical combinations, of which I have zero idea how to do. These are all done by the equipment manufacturers. They're all done by the refrigerant manufacturers as to which ways are the best way to make this happen. Um, the important thing on here is we can start to see, anybody heard of R12 yeah. or R11? Those were our great refrigerants. They were great refrigerants right up until 1986. R22 is on here as well. R22 was just banned in 2010 for all new equipment. So everybody who's got a heat pump that's been replaced in the past seven years has seen a new refrigerant on here. The biggest thing to look at, you know, the far side of this chart is the coefficient of performance. You can see all of our nasty refrigerants, R12, R22, they got a pretty good coefficient of performance of 10 to 11. Now we're going to better ones, R410A. All of a sudden we're looking at at least a 10% decrease from 11 to 11 and a half coefficient of performance down to about 10.4. How do we make up that? We had to get bigger equipment. We have to make that up somewhere. The other thing to look at is the pressures. R12, R22, we ran at lower pressures, 180, 125 PSI. A lot lower pressures the whole system's ran at. Now, with our 410A, we're running close to 300 PSI. That makes all of our equipment bigger, it makes the installation more complex. Everybody wonders, why do we have to replace all the refrigerant line sets? They're all designed for a maximum condenser pressure of 173 PSI. Now we gotta handle 275 PSI. Everything's gotta go. So now, we look at the environmental performance of the refrigerants as well. And this is where you can see there's two numbers. The very first one we focused on that in Montreal was the ozone depletion potential. And that was how much ozone are we going to kill. And then how long did it last in the air? You can see R11 and R12 last 100 years, 45. Uh, for reference, R11 is considered an ozone depletion potential of 1. Everything else is rated relative to R11. So R12, a little bit better, 24% better. It lasted longer in the atmosphere, though. Bad thing. R22, only 12 years in the atmosphere. That's a great refrigerant. Ozone depletion potential, not too bad. Pretty close to zero. Uh, R410A is, where's it on this chart? Somehow it's missing. The 410 was a better refrigerant. The next thing we started worrying about when Kyoto got signed was the global warming potential. We started realizing that all these refrigerants were leaking into the atmosphere and they were lasting for a long time in the atmosphere. Uh, R22, the last 12 years in the atmosphere, the global warming potential, it's pretty bad relative to CO2. So the industry shifted pretty dramatically and we started banning refrigerants and what we could and couldn't use. So it's been a big challenge as we have looked at these sorts of things. Have refrigerants always been recaptured, or have they just, nope. uh, just released the cans? They used to just be released in the atmosphere. So since when have they been required to be recaptured? I believe it was Montreal when EPA started doing refrigerant recycling and refrigerant recovery practices. Uh, it's always been a good thing because refrigerant has been costly, but it was also cheap for a long time. So. Was it recycled? No. The recycling programs didn't exist until we started banning refrigerants. Once you, once you ban new production of a refrigerant, you had to start, they started the recycling program to have a source for replacing the refrigerant. So what's the, what's recaptured? With what's recaptured right now? Right now it's recycled. It is. Yeah. Now it's recycled for use in there. And there's sort of a cost balance right now. So how do we apply all these things? We look at the building type, we look at the building usage, and what we do for a school is different. We do it for a hospital, it's different than we do for an office building. How's the occupancy? Is it 24-7? Are we only eight hours a day? How long is that? What can we maintain? Uh, maintenance, not always priority for anybody. Uh, we joke, we, we joke on some installations that you know maintenance, 
Everybody raise their hands. So maintenance isn't a priority for us. You don't need, you, you don't, not going to have one of those nice private buildings where we, we do gold plate and maintenance. Of. Like if you work for a developer, the developers don't do maintenance either. Nobody spends money on maintenance. The school district, where's the money going for a school district? We run until it breaks and somebody starts complaining. Unfortunately, that's the environment everybody lives in. We also consider the location and weather factor. So a couple things I wanted to highlight as far as what we do and how we can help you. Or at least how I think we can help you. Maybe we can, maybe we, maybe we do. Uh, we do job shadows. So if you have students who are highly interested in physics, uh, or if they're interested in electrical engineering, uh, for how we design building power systems or telecom systems, if you've got interested high school students, we can have them come by, you know, spend the afternoon or something like that with us for a week program or something like that. We can come up with some details. Uh, happy to come by the school as well and talk through it. Um, in Kansas City, we have a fairly big presence. That's our CEO there. Uh, we did the whole Battle of the Brains presentation out of one of their, their local science museums. So we have a very strong interest in doing this. I mentioned ASHRAE. Uh, why is what we do important? Uh, this is the overall U.S. energy consumption in 2003. We primarily impact commercial and industrial, so you can see uh, we account for roughly 50% of the energy usage for the entire country. And when we start to break that down for the commercial building, See, space cooling accounts for and, and, uh, the portions that we as mechanical engineers have control over for cooling, ventilation, uh, heating, and refrigeration. We account for roughly 43% of the energy usage. So we have a very large impact on the ability to do this. I mentioned I'm a consulting engineer. I take all the equipment to figure out what the best application for it is. Within mechanical, there's a whole bunch of different things. The so people who design chillers, the people who develop the next generation of refrigerators. Or people who sell the equipment, um, people who install the equipment. So there's a whole bunch of different paths. So if your students are talking to you about, you know, what what really are my options to applying physics, to applying chemical, and applying electrical engineering, there's multiple ways to get at this as we get in there. So um, one thing I don't know if you noticed, but I felt guilty coming to a bunch of teachers and not citing all of my figures. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's Chicago manual style, not APA that I always have to do in high school. So every figure in here. Uh, so when it gets posted to the website, it uh, has a reference to where it's at, and this is the, essentially the source of cited for every uh, picture that is in there. So, any questions? <laughs>